Good morning. God bless everyone here. Amen. Seen and unseen. As we sung those songs this morning and, you know, they bring back memories, what I was reminded of is that <clears throat> even though Bishop Chuck is with the Lord now and Pastor Jim is with the Lord now, they're still very much alive because there's only life. There's only God. Amen. And as we sang those songs, uh, it, the, the word echo comes to me. It echoes. Mm -hmm. Things we've said, things we've ministered, songs we've sung, the hearts of people that have been here with us throughout all the years, it echoes. Amen. Just like the throw the rock in the pond and the ripple, you may not see it when it's in the middle of the pond, but it's going to reach the other side. And those ripples in God, they don't stop. You know, in the natural, it's going to go to the other side and eventually come down. But in God, he's like, hey, I don't sleep and I don't rest. I keep moving because he's working his plan. And, you know, I, I, it, it blesses me because it's our heart's cry to honor and worship the Lord. It's, it's, it's part of our servitude to him. It's, it's not, we're not being forced to do anything we want to. It's our heart's desire yes. to honor and worship him. And it should be our heart's desire to minister and, and help people if we can, if they allow it, you know. Right. So uh, I wanted to talk today. I don't, I don't know how long I'll go. It probably won't be as long as normal. We kind of started a little late. And, uh, you go as long as the Spirit leads you unless you've got something else to keep you from it. I know. And um, I wanted to talk about the anointing that breaks the yoke. Um, talking about the anointing, a lot of people have their ideas and misconceptions. The same with the Holy Spirit. They either believe it or they don't, or it's, it's not real, or it's real, or it only happens to certain people or whatever. But, you know, let's see. Let's get educated and see what the Word has to say about it, you know? Because we don't go by opinions around here. We go by the facts of the Word. What's, what's the Bible trying to tell us? What's the Bible trying to teach us? So I went to the Internet. I always go to the Internet, and it's usually filled with a bunch of mixture. You have truth mixed with false concepts and ideas. But I just like to see what people say about it, not because I can't study my own books or, or the Bible. I just want to see, you know. And uh, they, meaning Christians, or whoever writes these articles, you know, I, I would assume you would be a Christian if you're writing about Christian information. You know, it's not like somebody working for a newspaper or a magazine. They're, they're just doing an article. But ones that have these websites, you know, spiritual websites for biblical information, you would think that they'd be Christian, right? Okay. And what others would say about the anointing. So the first one website that was on the top of the list showed like, hey, we got 66 scriptures. Well, nobody's going to go into 66 scriptures in a service. I'm sorry, that's just too much. And you're probably going to overshoot the point. And we don't want to do that. The second one on the list didn't really believe what they said what the Bible says. Uh, so I wrote down what they, what they, their first paragraph was. It says, Christ overcomes all bondage. Well, we know that. You know, 
by his stripes were healed. He, death was nailed to the cross. That everything was done at Calvary was completed and finished. The finished work of the cross. Some minister that you know says, but the focus is upon the work of Christ and not some vague anointing. Hmm. Interesting. God can break any chain, even the powerful chain of the Assyrians, which they don't go into explaining what that is. And that's a pretty powerful message. Well, not according to you, whoever wrote that article. I mean, it went down and down, and I'm like, wow, I just wanted to see, you know, what's, what's the first few websites talking about that are on the main list, you know. So, so with that in mind, let's, let's learn some truth today. What is the anointing? Okay, I put, and I did look it up, so don't worry, I put the supernatural ability to go beyond the natural mind is one aspect. It's supernatural. It's not a human ability. It's a spiritual ability. Um, now, here's one that shoots down what that guy just wrote. If we go to First John... And, uh, I mean, the Bible's pretty clear. If you, if you want to believe the words of the Bible, it tells you what you need to know, you know. First John chapter 2 and verse 27 says, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. Hey, it's in you. It's not vague. It's not maybe one of these things that it, it, it worked so it was a fluke, but... I don't know. No. I mean, when I get done with this, we'll, we'll know what it is, what it does, and it's in you. Same as Christ. Christ in you. And guess what? The two go hand in hand. One doesn't operate without the other, just so you know. It's in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie... And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now, they're, they're talking about the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus. So he's saying, because of this, there is an anointing that goes along with it. Okay? And you're like, well, you name the title breaks the yoke. Right. Because that's the first thing the anointing can do, but it does many things. Not only does it break or destroy bondages and things in our lives, but it also produces positive things, okay? Uh, the word anointing there, it's the Greek 5545 from 5548. It says a smearing, and they get that from, like, taking oil, you know, and smearing it on people's foreheads, the, the cross, or wiping it across something, or, or I mean, it, it's, you have so many instances in the Old Testament where they're just pouring oil on the people's heads, letting it run down all over them. I mean, it's an oily mess. I, I would hate to be the person that has to wash all that. But they're, they're just pouring it on. But this is, this is a type of smearing, which to me is more personal if you're getting smeared, uh, it says that is a special endowment, chrism, C-H-R-I-S-M, which means consecrated oil, and it says unction. So this is not natural, it's supernatural, because it's an unction. And then I put, well, what's another example of smearing, you know, just for fun? in the Bible. Well, smearing of anointing oil. Uh, if you go to Exodus, they talk about the blood on the lintel and doorposts. They don't use the word smear, but they use the word strike. But it's, it's like the same thing. They're smearing it on those posts. They're putting it on there. It's, it's an application. It's being applied. And we know that the blood represents the blood of Jesus. Hey, cover my household with your blood. Cover your temple with your blood. Why? So the death spirit can pass over you. So death can stay away from you. I'm not talking natural death. 
That's what that story was about. But we're talking about today and, and right now, what would be a death for, uh, for a Christian to be separated from God? To be separated from word. That's your daily bread. You don't want to separate yourself from your daily bread. You'll go hungry. Spiritually. And what happens when you go hungry? You die. The scripture says the natural man perishes every day. That he perishes because he's not getting the substance he needs. He's only going by what he sees. Natural senses. Taste, touch, see, smell, hear. But he's not hearing the spirit. He's not tasting the bread of life. He's not seeing what God is doing. He only sees the bad in everything. Well, wouldn't it be better if we could just wipe out the bad and everything and just see the good and everything? Because it's there. Right. What happens when we got somebody with an ugly attitude? Do we sit there and judge by what we see? Or do we look for what God has done in that person and remind them, hey, you're forgetting something here. You're forgetting what God has done for you. And maybe you got your eyes off focus of him, and that's why you're in whatever problem you're in now. But he's like, I've got the way out of your trap. Why are you still in there? How long do you want to be in your pity party? Right. How long do you want to be defeated? How long do you not want to be able to see life and enjoy it? You just want to hate everything, and that other mind, it'll, it'll destroy you, literally. Yes. We don't want that. Um, any healing balm or salve that they would use for healing wounds on people, that's another type of smearing. The blood of Jesus is applied to our lives. We know that. That's just a few examples. I'm sure there are many others, but it mainly deals with blood and oil. But with the anointing, it's greater than that. Okay? Now, I want to go to Matthew. And Jesus is talking here, I believe. Matthew 28. And I'm just going to start reading here just a little bit here. It says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. I don't think he's telling them a, a lie here or some kind of bedtime story. He's like, no, if, you, if you're if you weary and you need rest, you come unto me. And you sit down with me and you talk with me. And I'm going to give you the substance you need, the healing you need, the anointing you need, the knowledge that you need, and you're going to be restored. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That's almost impossible for some people. They don't want to learn. This generation now, they don't want to learn. They think everything should be given to them. I've heard some crazy stuff lately because I don't read the newspaper and I don't follow the news much except for what I see on Facebook and some social media stuff, which I don't get bogged down in because it, it's all negative. But if you really want to know what's going on, you could you could take a look at it every now and then and say, yeah, it's the same old, same old, you know. They're giving, you know, the government is giving people jobs to do certain things that they have no business doing. Look at that train wreck. Near, near miss happens with airplanes now because people that are in charge now, they don't even know anything about an airplane. They're just putting people in charge of things and it's like, why would the other mind that's been in charge of that all of a sudden accept this other mind to say, why not? It's beyond me. Which is going to, there's going to be a lot more disasters, I'm sorry. A lot more sorrow and sadness. Causing chaos. Causing chaos. But the reason for that is for people to wake up and say, look, this ain't right. It's not right, and you're letting it happen. Why else would he be pouring his spirit out now 
in that other state, that revival. You can call it a revival. It's not. He's pouring his spirit out because he needs new, fresh people with his anointing to break that mindset that they've been in and get in his mindset to say, hey, they took me out of schools. They took me out of colleges. I'm not allowed to do anything anymore, which isn't true. But he's like, I need to raise up another generation with the correct mindset to get me back in there and start making things right. But when it happens, this time, this time, it's not going to fall apart. It's not going to be taken away like times past. It's different now. We can't live in the past of what's happened. We can only live in the now. I mean, we can sit here and say that video we watched is in the past. But when I heard it, it's echoing as if it was happening right today. Why else could I feel the anointing? Well, you're just thinking of memories and that's why it made you cry. No. It goes way beyond the natural mind. I wasn't sad for anything. I'm worshiping the Lord. My heart is drawn to him. And he's helping me. Amen. You know, there's a difference. Amen. Here we see that, okay, let me, let me just finish reading the scripture here. It says, verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Okay, he uses the word yoke here. Uh, it's the Greek 2218. It says to join a coupling that is servitude, beam of balance. Now we know in the natural, we got to put yokes on animals. Blinders on horses, yokes on animals because they need to till the ground, plant vegetables and stuff. Well, that was the old days. And they have equipment to do that now. But that's what it was for, to control the animals to make them do what you wanted them to do and not hurt themselves. God's yoke, he's not controlling us. And he says servitude. Our heart is drawn to him and we want to serve him. We want to honor him. We want to learn what he has to say. And he says there's going to come time when you've learned enough that I'm going to loose you to people so they can start learning. Doesn't mean you've arrived. Doesn't mean you've been perfected. Now, in him, we're all perfect, okay? You can't see it. I can't see it. But he says, in me, you're complete. So, with that in mind, I have to believe it. You know, it's not what we see. It's what he says. That is. And he uses the word burden here. It's 5413 in the Greek. It says an invoice, a task or service as part of... A of freight to carry or bear. Now, there's a lot of language in the Bible that if you just look at it at face value, it doesn't make sense. But ships in the Bible, you know, we know ships carry cargo, carry people that carry cargo. But he's talking about people carrying something within them. His spirit, his word, and along with that, his abilities. We're carrying that. And that, that is not a burden. That's not a burden. It's an honor. Yeah. Okay? So, I want to go to Ephesians 4.1 and see what that has to say. 4.1. Because in that in Matthew there it talked about servitude so Ephesians 4 1 says and this is Paul talking I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called now he's referring to himself as a prisoner referring to the servitude but we're not in a prison and we're not bound by shackles or we're put into a cell 
and we're limited on what we can do. He's like, no, in me, you have liberty, and I want you to do greater things than I've done, is what he's going to tell them. Uh, you're going to do greater things. Second Timothy 1.8 One eight. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Now, I'm not going to go explaining all of this, but that's what we're doing right now. That is part of the day of the Lord. That is part of the marriage supper of the Lamb, is we're partakers in this word, letting it have its way in our mind, okay? The word prisoner, it's the Greek 12.10, it says to bind in various applications, literally or figuratively, Greek 11.63, necessary. He's saying it's necessary to be my prisoner. A need of, Greek 1189, a petition to want. And a petition means to make a request. And I put this question, what is the request of this petition? I didn't, I didn't try to find it or look for it. I just wrote down, uh, it was a song I wrote years ago when I was in a certain frame of mind seeking the Lord, reaching out to him. I was hurting. I was confused. I was in a state of in between, I guess you'd call it. But I was going to church. I was serving God to the best of my ability. But, you know, there's a learning period that's harder than any other learning period. And that's when you start. When all the excitement calms down, there's a learning period, and in that learning period, it takes time for God to explain things to us and for us to understand it. It takes time. It took years for me. So in, in my heart's cry, I'm singing this song. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Can you take the broken pieces and make them whole? I'm here in this place. I'm talking about a building. I'm down on my knees. I'm praying forgiveness, and I'm seeking release. I want to touch the hem of your garment. Then all my troubles would go away. I need your love. I need your touch. I need your healing. That's the state of mind I was in when I wrote this song. It was my heart's cry to the Lord. I need to get out of this position. I feel like I'm stuck. I'm not moving forward. I'm not progressing. I'm not learning. I'm not this. I'm that. But we can't go by feelings. You know, he says, you're, you're going to see the fruit on your tree. Sometimes you plant trees and you don't see fruit on them for a couple of years. They've got to take root. They've got to get comfortable with their surroundings in order to produce. It's true in the natural. You can't just plant a tree and the next year have a, have a crop. It doesn't work that way, you know. I had so much stuff happen to me in my life. I had a good life. I have a good life. But I had so many things happen to me, negative experiences, that it just crushes you to the point where you have no confidence. You don't want to speak to anybody because if you do, you know, you're just going to get your head lopped off. And you may as well just stay in the corner somewhere and hide under that rock. But God's like, oh, if you hide under the rock, how are you going to get my sunshine? How are you going to get my fresh breeze, my rain? Now, the rain can seep under the rock or through the rock, but it's not the same. It's like, I need you to come up hither. I need you to... And he, he did help, help out of that thing, that mindset you're in, 
the snare, the trap. And it's not just one. There could be a whole bunch, you know. Uh, let's go over to Isaiah. Mr. Isaiah, chapter 10, verse 24. I'm going to start reading. It says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. Now he's not talking about Assyrians in the natural, and he's not talking about Egypt in the natural. We know that Egypt represents a type of bondage. Okay? The Assyrian... Believe it or not, I looked it up. Here it's the Hebrew, 804. It says, in the sense of successful. And you're sitting there going, but he's saying this is a negative thing. Why is he saying it's successful? Aha. Now we're going to learn something. Let's learn something. So I looked at Assyrian and the metaphysical here, and I was looking at some of my other uh, Bible dictionaries and and things just to see what it would say. But this is what I want it to, what it what it really means. And so, this is the metaphysical's description. It's not the Greek or the Hebrew. It's the metaphysical. It's their two cents worth on what this is saying, but a lot of times they'll hit the they'll hit the nail on the head, okay? So judge it how you want. It's not my opinion. It says, the reasonings, philosophical and physical, that do not recognize the spiritual head of the universe. The Assyrian thinks it's successful. So where have we heard this before? The scripture that says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end result is death. They think they're successful in what they're doing in life, but they don't realize that they're hurting people, destroying people's lives, gambling with people's lives, and they don't really care. They think it's success, and God's like, no, you're hurting my people. You are the opposite of successful. They do not recognize the spiritual head of the universe, which is God. They, they do not honor God. But are based upon sense observation. Five senses. They can't see past the tip of their nose. They can't hear God speaking. Their hearts are not drawn to him. Upon the formed instead of the formless, such thoughts are destructive and undisciplined. If a man keeps his attention fixed on spirit, he is protected from the materialism that is constantly encroaching upon his consciousness. But if he worships the mysterious and the occult, or if he reasons wholly from the appearances of the senses of, or outer world, he defeats the protective action of the higher law and falls into the hands of the Assyrians. They couldn't get any better description than that. It's the carnal mind. Doesn't honor God. Doesn't want to do what he's what he's doing. He's not on board with it. It has its own agenda. But God's like, I'm I'm putting a stop to this agenda, one thing at a time. All this destructive behavior throughout His creation, He's putting an end to it, one step at a time. He wants glory in what He's doing. If every knee is going to bow and every tongue confess that he's Lord, a work has to be done in the people, not just some marvelous event going, oh, it's God. No, he has to touch their hearts. And he's going to get that. Now, I want to put some examples of the anointing. It's just a few. There's probably a lot more. I don't have time in this study to, to just sit there and name 66 scriptures. You know, uh, Samson, not filled with the Holy Spirit, because Jesus hadn't come yet. Here's a guy that can literally 
Now, it doesn't tell how he learned to do this, but I'm sure God showed him. Amen? People don't just do things just because, and they're like, whatever. No, he still honored God. So God had to show him this. He would literally shake himself just into the anointing. And he could do supernatural feats of strength and speed. Not for his glory, for God. But so many people forget the story of Samson. They made, all, they made several movies and all this, but they always exclude that he wasn't just some young guy running around causing problems. He judged Israel for 20 years. He was a judge for 20 years. So this didn't just happen a short amount of time. People forget about that. They don't put that in there. It just looks like some guy that, that doesn't like what's going on and he's going to kill a bunch of people and, and this and that and he's just making mischief. No. There was a reason for all that. God has purpose in everything. Everything that's happening has a purpose, we, but we can't see it all. But just know that it's there, and we are to judge nothing. We are to judge no man and nothing, because just because we don't understand and we can't see what's happening, there's a purpose in it. There's some stuff that's going to happen. I'm not going to mention it. There's some stuff that's going to happen that's going to baffle scientists. God said he's going to do here soon. So I'm just going to let that ride out, and then we'll talk about it later. Let's go to Second, Second Samuel. <clears throat> Second Samuel, chapter 6, verse 6. Now we're still talking about different types of anointing. Okay? And when they came, and I didn't look up how to pronounce this name, when they came to Nishan's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the ox shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. Now they were trying to transport the ark somewhere, and... He touched it and died. Now, I remember years ago, Benny Hinn had his brother, Willie, on his program on TV. I just happened to be flipping through and saw it, and I stopped. And Willie is the more educated minister. I'm sorry. Benny Hinn is a great minister, man of God. But there's more knowledge and understanding and Willie, and they were talking about this exact same incident, and he says the ark didn't kill the guy. He said the anointing did. Of course, Benny Hinn was shocked. The anointing? Yeah. It can, it can be destructive or productive. But see, they were transporting the ark without understanding what it was, what it meant. So David's like, stop everything. This, this ain't right. We lost a man. This shouldn't be happening. I don't understand. I thought we were doing the will of the Lord here. I, I don't understand. It took them three months to research how to move the ark correctly. And all it took was putting it on the shoulders of the priesthood. Which that was then, and spiritually speaking now, it's on our shoulders, that priesthood, okay, that authority. Zechariah, let's go to Zechariah, chapter 4, verse 6. And I, I wrote this down, so this is how we do it. This is how we access the anointing in us, okay? Chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, 
nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. It's not by might. It's not by anything that a man can do. You know, the, what's that other scripture? Um, uh, the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. You know, and this is what Jesus was trying to explain to the disciples. I, I have to go away, guys. I have to go away so I can come back. He says, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm not going to leave you without the anointing. You're going to have you're going to have the ability. And they they just could not understand it. Because their eyes spiritually hadn't been opened yet. It takes the anointing. Where do you think we get revelation from? It's not from reading. You could read the book front to back and back to front and still not get it. Right. It takes the spirit of the Lord to discern it for us. But the Bible's clear. That anointing is in you. It doesn't come from anywhere else because he's in us. It's coming from him. Now, if we go over to, that explains how we access it, by the Spirit. If we go over to John 14, that's going to explain how it works. So let's go over to John chapter 14, and I'm going to start reading in verse 12. <clears throat> Jesus is talking, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Well, people just don't grasp this. He's saying we're going to do greater than what Jesus did. And so many people cannot even compare themselves to him. They cannot see themselves as equals. Even though Philippians 2.6 says otherwise, Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God, and neither should we, because we're all from the same source. Why would you be any less? Well, we're not Jesus. No, you're not. But you're just like him, which means you have the same abilities. You can learn the same knowledge, do the same things. But he says you can do greater. Why? I'm going to the Father. Why? So I can come back and live in you as spirit, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. It's going to work. Okay? Where was, okay. Verse 13, and whatsoever ye ask in my name, that will I do. Now he's not talking about, well, I asked you for a, a Ferrari yesterday and I didn't get it. He's not talking about material possessions. If you asked him for greater understanding of his word, oh yeah, it's going to come. It may not come when you expect it, but if you stay mentally connected to him, when it shows up, you'll know. And then you'll have it. And it'll always be a part of us. It'll always be a part. Whatever you ask in my name, it could be you're praying for somebody. Keep praying. Now, God's not deaf. But he's like, if you haven't seen me move, just keep, keep, keep praying. Don't give up. Okay? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, if you love him, keep his commandments. For starters, keep the Ten Commandments, because there's a lot of commandments. But for starters, at least go there. What's the very first one? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, not some of it, not just a fraction of it or a little smidgen. He says, all your heart. And it goes further. He says, all your soul. 
everything that's you and all your mind. He wants it all. That's the very first commandment, and people can't do it. Well, I can't. It's mine. No, it's his. He gave you life. Why are you denying him friendship, unionship? Why are you denying him a relationship? The servitude is not what you think. We have liberty. We're not bound by shackles and chains. We're not being told what to do, when to do it. He, he basically says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Go to church. Learn. That's my servitude. Just learn. Keep learning. If you're not learning, <laughs> go to another church. But follow his spirit that you're led to the proper place you need to be in. Doesn't mean that wherever you land, you're going to be there for the rest of your life. It doesn't mean that. Because he might move you around. He moves people around. I'm sorry. The purpose of a church isn't to fill it up. That's it. It's bringing people in, moving them on, bringing more in, moving them out, bringing. But you have, you have pillars in the church that stay there. There's a foundation that stays there. You know, there's people that will remain there. That's fine. We're pillars. Okay? We're just waiting for the next harvest to come through. Why? Because he said it would. He said it would. And we're still here. Faithful. Not giving up. Because I'm not just ministering to the ones that are here. I'm ministering to everybody that we can't see. Because I guarantee you they're here. They're shepherded by ministry all over the world to church services to learn because they didn't get it here. They're still learning. Without us, they cannot be made whole. So when you think that's us four no more, you could have thousands listening to the word. That should be encouraging. The echoes are going forth. That ripple in the pond is still going. Don't be discouraged. It's as unto the Lord. If that's not reward enough, I, I don't know what is. To be honest, it's unto the Lord. I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm going to keep reading here. Verse 16, I will pray the Father, he shall give you another comforter, that, ye, that he may abide with you forever, not just for a few years, like Jesus was on earth, 33 and a half years or whatever, 33 years, he's going to be with you forever. Okay? Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Okay? I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. He makes it very clear who the Holy Spirit is. He says, I will come to you. Yet a little while the world seeth me no more, but ye see me because I live. Ye shall live also. That's another thing for people to consider. Because he lives, we have to face tomorrow. Because he lives, I live also. And if he lives... I'm going to live as long as I can, praising and worshiping my God. Why? Because that was his plan. And in that day you shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Well, you know, the night, the night that I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I wasn't asking for it. I wasn't looking for it. I was just in an emotional state of sadness because of my current situation and you could say all the hurts in my life, but at that point I wasn't thinking of all those. I was just focused on the current situation. And there was a visiting ministry there. I don't even remember their name anymore. It's been it's been so long. And when it happened, 
It didn't come into me, it came out of me. There was like a burning sensation, not heartburn, supernatural pressure and fire. It's the only way I can describe it. And it just came out of the innermost being, the inner man, just whoop. And you're sitting there going, what just happened? That was in there? And I knew it was Jesus. He's in there? But I didn't ask. I didn't. He's in every single human being, waiting, waiting for the right moment to reveal himself to them. And when he does, are you going to take him by the hand and run with him through life? Or are you going to smack that hand away and be like, I got this, like a carnal man? What, what choice are you going to make? So, here's another aspect. I might be able to get this done. The anointing, okay, it breaks bondages. But it also cleanses. It's a cleansing. A cleansing what? Our minds. Okay? Okay. We sing, we sing a song, you know. Wash me by the water of your word. Cleanse my heart, for I love you, Lord. What do you think the word is doing for people? It's, it's cleaning out their brain and causing them to re, relearn and refocus on who they really are and what God, who God is and what he's doing. It's, it's, and it's strengthening their relationship. It's consecration, okay? It's convicting and then reconvincing us, changing our minds from thoughts of death or separation from him into pure life, which is what he really wants. He wants you to live life the proper way. And then last but not least is coronation. I guess you could call this the three C's. Coronation. Well, what's coronation? The crowning of a king or queen, okay? Being crowned with a new mind, all right? Making us kings and priests, because that's what scripture says he's doing with us. I'm making you a priest, because after the old order, a priest could only be a priest, and a king could only be a king. But in this new order, you're gonna be both. You're gonna rule and reign with me together in the kingdom, my mindset, and you're going to be a priesthood because it's after the order of Melchizedek, which means we're going to think the right way, therefore we're going to speak the right way and act the right way. And we have the knowledge. It says that the knowledge is at the lips of the priesthood. He's burned it in there. It's become a part of us, and Proverbs goes over and over with things saying, don't forget this, don't forget that. Bind it around your neck. Don't forget this. Don't forget that. We have to constantly remember what he's done and what he's doing and not just throw it away. The instance trouble comes. No, he's like, go to your foundation. What did I say to do? How do you handle this? You'll know. You'll know right from wrong because it's by his spirit. Not yours. <laughs> Makes it real simple, right? All right. <clears throat> You're sitting there crowning, yeah. Let's go over to uh, Leviticus. I know this is Old Testament, and it's talking about the Levitical priesthood, but it still has to do with what's going on today, all right? Uh, Leviticus chapter 21, verse 12. And, it, and it's talking about the priesthood in the sanctuary. But I still think this is pertinent today. Neither shall he or you go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his God, for the crown of the anointing oil is of his God is upon him. I am the Lord. Basically, when I see this, it says, when you come into this mindset, don't leave it. This 
This is the temple of the Holy Ghost. This is the temple of God. The temple not made with hands. All right? This is where he wanted to live all along. That was his plan, to live in man. He's like, don't profane this temple. I'm not, I'm, I don't have time to get into that today. He just said, once you're in this frame of mind, you've learned enough about who you are and what's going on and who I am. You're not going to dishonor me. Okay? But he says, if you leave this mindset, this is what's going to happen. Death. Well, the perfect example is in Genesis, in the garden. They were already in the mind of God. And he said, you can eat of all the trees, but there's one. There's another mind there that I don't want you to partake in. Because it causes death. It causes separation. It causes separation. We don't want anything to interrupt our relationship with God. And you could go into that other scripture about, you know, what could separate us from the love of God? Not life, not death, not this, that, this, that, this, that. Unless you let it, choice is still yours. Okay. First <clears throat> uh, John, I've already quoted it, but I ha we haven't gone there. First John 4, 4. said, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You, you have to believe that. Greater is he that is in you. Who's in you? Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God. They're all there. They're all one, and you're one with them. That's why Jesus said, you, you're going to do greater than me because I'm going to be in you. Before it was just me. Working with God, now we're going to be in you. You, you. you got the best package deal ever. If you want to look at it that way, you know, the gift that keeps on giving. So we see that the anointing, it's not vague. It is very real and has many different aspects to it. It breaks the addiction of alcohol. That was... You know, the first thing the anointing did for me is it, it would always move my heart to cry, to break down whatever wall was there so God could <coughs> minister to me. So the anointing broke down walls that, that, in your mind, that would cause you not to be in a relation with him. The next thing he did when I did receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the anointing broke my addiction for alcohol because I was drinking I was drinking a lot. I no lo it no longer had power over me to sit here and say you want me, you want one, you need to go buy one, you need to buy another. I didn't have that desire anymore. God. One aspect of the anointing, it breaks the addiction of drugs. Sexual lusts. Disappointments. I had a lot. Disappointments with myself. Disappointments with others. You, you could throw back to the message the last time I was here about forgiveness. We've got to forgive ourselves before we do anything else. Disappointments. Regrets. It breaks the addiction of regrets. Self-condemnation. That's a big one for people. <laughs> so many people are conde condemning themselves over little things. Oh, I'm not worthy. Uh, I beg to differ, God made you worthy, okay? You're listening to the wrong voice. The ability to overcome obstacles in our lives, achieve goals in life, self-improvement, healing, learning, et cetera, et cetera. You can keep going with it. The anointing doesn't just destroy bondages. It produces positive things. The ability to overcome obstacles, the ability to put up with people, <laughs> There's, there's a lot of forbearing we have to do in life, you know. There is an anointing when we speak to people about God or the Word. You don't just do it. There's an anointing there, believe it or not. There's an anointing right now while I'm doing this. My dad would say, he says, son, there's going to be times where when you're, when you're ministering words 
word studies and stuff like that, that you won't feel that there's much anointing. He says, but there is. I understood. It's not that exciting. Or is it? Learning should be exciting because that's foundation. Without the proper foundation, I'm sorry, an airplane couldn't fly. Without the proper foundation, well, we made the outer hole and we got the propellers on there. I think we can push it off the cliff and it'll run. No, you forgot the engine and all the electronics. It looked good. There, there's some stuff that has to be first formed and made and maintained. Okay? When There's an anointing when we minister, teach, or preach. It doesn't matter what aspect of the fivefold ministry is going on. There's an anointing to it, and there's a reason for it. The anointing is our God-given ability to live correctly and be witnesses of his glory to his creation. The anointing breaks the yoke that holds us back from progressing in life. It is all of this and so much more. And remember, it, it, it's not vague because the Bible says it's in you. Amen? Amen? It's in us. And we have access to it. And if you're not sure how to access to it, ask God. Ask the Holy Spirit that's in you. How do I access the anointing? Well, what's your current goal? What are you trying to do? You trying to pray better? You trying to do word studies? You trying to learn? You just want a better relationship with him? Ask him. Why do you think Jesus spent so much time praying to him? He wasn't just making requests. He was talking to God about things he didn't like. The plan. Do I have to really die? Do I? Isn't there any other way? I mean, really. God, you're God. Isn't there any other way? Do I have to? It wasn't just that time. It was many times he talked to God about everything. And so can we. I would leave no stone unturned if I were you. I would get it all out there to him. It's okay to complain to God. He'd rather have you do that than go complain to your neighbor. And then have them get upset. He wants to be our burden bearer. He wants to... Lead us in the correct way. The reproofs of instruction are his way of life. And this is true. That's all I've got today on the anointing breaks the yoke. <clears throat> and uh, it's important and it's necessary. Amen? Amen? So that's all i got today. Thank you.